Welcome back to Pello Talk. We're continuing conversation with William Federer, a Christian historian on the completely Christian history of Christmas and Santa Claus and many, many traditions around that. And if you haven't watched uh, the previous episodes, head to davepello.com where you'll be able to find the, the other episodes in this. It's also in the video description. But uh, back to William Federer and Pello Talk. I'm an anti-feminist because I think it's oppressive. I think it's anti-male. I think it's anti anti-femininity. Now, it may be a very weak Brexit, but I'll tell you what, Brexit of any kind and leaving those treaties as well. That's the best yeah. ever interview. Yeah. Well, Michael Parkinson, you got nothing on this book. <laughs> and so here's Martin Luther. He ends the Saints' days. He moves all the gift giving to December 25th. He says, all gifts come from the Christ child. Yep. And um, See his Christmas story, tree in the background there. Right. So the story is he's coming home at Christmas Eve, it's a crisp winter night. He sees the stars twinkling and he decides to put candles in the tree in this house to uh, tell his children, this is like the sky above Bethlehem on the night of Christ's birth. Okay. And then there's toys, right? There's gift giving, there's toys all around. And I think it's funny. Um, if you look in the one side, there's a little boy with what? A crossbow. Uh, crossbow. Yeah. You could put your eye out with that thing. <laughs> Or the movie with the little boy and the BB gun. I don't know if you've seen that one. No, I haven't. There's a, there's a, a funny story of, um, you know, it's like a 1950s Christmas uh, movie uh, that's become a classic of uh, a little boy wants a BB gun for Christmas. And the mom's like, no, it's too dangerous. You can put your, your eye out. And the dad's like, oh, I'm going to get him the BB gun. You know, and, <laughs> Good. Thought, well, gee, back then they didn't have BB guns, but they got a little boy a crossbow. And the mom's like, you know, be careful there, you know. I wouldn't and, mind uh, a crossbow for Christmas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, so, uh, <laughs> tree. Uh, this has another interesting uh, part of the story. So, um, the tribes that had overrun the Roman Empire, uh, ca ca causing the fall of Rome. They're the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Anglos, the Saxons, the Jutes, the Lombards, um, and, uh, you know, all these different Visigoths, Ostrogoths, all of them. And these are Germanic tribes and they're pagan. And, um, as they came in, they would do their pagan practices. And so the Germans worshiped Thor, where we get the word Thor's day or Thursday that comes from the word Thor. Mm -hmm. And they worship Woden, where we get the word Woden's day or Wednesday. And so the Germans believed that Thor lived in a big oak tree in Geismar, Germany, and they would do human sacrifice in front of this tree to this god Thor. And so the same way you had St. Patrick as a missionary to Ireland, and I did a whole book on him. If you want me to do another DVD, you know. Uh, another interview about that would be interesting. Yeah, and, yeah there's uh, uh, lots we can explore with you. But the same way that Patrick was the missionary to Ireland, St. Boniface, he's also called Winfred, is the missionary to the Germans. And so uh, Charles Martel, he's the one who stops the Muslim invasion of Europe uh, in uh, six, uh, seven, seven uh, Battle of Tours, 732 AD. And Charles Martel's grandson is Charlemagne. Just to give a little, uh, mm -hmm. uh, for those wanting to have markers to identify what period of time this is. So it's the year is 722 AD, St. Boniface, missionary to the Germans, and it's the night before Christmas. And he comes to, into their, their village and takes an ax and chops down Thor's tree. Come on now. Sort of like, uh, you know, Gideon yeah. chopping down the... Uh, you know, the idol and the, 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 the grove of trees, you know, to bail, you know. So here, uh, Boniface chops down the tree that they were about to sacrifice. Some say they were going to sacrifice an animal. Other stories say they were going to sacrifice little Prince uh, Alsof, who was, you know, a captured prince, but they were going to sacrifice him. And so this was a real courageous act of St. Boniface. And some people say, stop him, stop him. And others say, wait a second, if Thor is really a god, he can protect his own tree. Yeah, plus Again, he's swinging like, an axe. Yeah. And um, so there's lots of, you know, depictions throughout history of him chopping down Thor's big tree. Good. And uh, after he chops it down, uh, uh, 
again, this is like Christmas Eve. Um, he says, let there be no shedding of blood tonight and let this tree not, you know, uh, not have any more blood. Um, and then he points to a little evergreen tree um, and says, uh, let this be the tree of the Christ child. Um, Henry Van Dyke uh, wrote a poem, the first Christmas tree, 1906, telling the story of St. Boniface, Winfred, apostles mm -hmm. of the Germans, the day before Christmas in the year of our Lord, 722. Not a drop of blood shall fall tonight, for this is the birth night of Christ, Son of God, All Father, uh, Son of the All Father, Savior of the world. He's, and he points to the little tree and says, This little tree, a young child of the forest, shall be your home tree tonight. It is the wood of peace, for your houses are built of fir, you know, cedar, because it doesn't get bugs in it. So it's a, you know, it's a good wood to build houses with. It is the sign of endless life, for its branches are ever green. It points toward heaven. Let this be called the tree of the Christ child. Gather about it with loving gifts of kindness. Wow, so that's really fascinating. So in that little town in Germany, they still have a statue of St. Boniface with an ax, hmm. uh, with a tree chopped down. And uh, there he is, you know, holding the church that, uh, you know, they built in its place. Ah, wow. So far from, far from being a pagan um, symbol, the, the Christmas tree, it's actually a symbol of defiance and defeat of paganism. Right. Um, I, um, what, uh, you know, we, our kids are all grown now, but when they're little, we went to a church and uh, when it comes up to Halloween, they're like, well, we don't want to celebrate Halloween. It's pagan. But all the kids uh, have all their friends that get all this candy. And so they say, hey, we'll do a, a nice little you know, party at the church and we'll tell the kids to dress up as Bible characters. And then, you know, and they'll have little games for them in the gymnasium. They'll give them all little presents, you know, and and um, uh, my, my one son wanted to dress up like Moses. And for the record, nobody was naked in the gymnasium. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> and, um, uh, and so we, uh, you know, one of my daughters was Miriam and then we had a brand new baby boy and my wife had a basket. We put our little baby son in there. And so that was like, you know, Moses and the fat fetch basket. And, but, but my one son wanted to be Moses as, and so we got him a, a gray beard, uh, a gray wig, um, you know, a, a robe, a staff. And then I cut out two, um, uh, pieces of wood and uh, in the shape of tablets and spray painted them. So they're gray. And he had a big black marker, magic marker. And he, he actually wrote about himself. It, it started really wide and, you know, I am the Lord, but then he'd have to squeeze the letters together. He did. <laughs> um, and, and so he would, and on our way home from the, um, from the church, uh, we were passing all these houses and these kids going up to get candy and my son wanted to. So I, I let him go up to some of the houses and, uh, you know, the, the kids would like say a joke or something. And so the people in the house would, would come up and say, oh, little boy, what do you have to say? And he'd say, I'm the Lord thy God. There shall no other gods before me. Thou shall not worship bottles. Thou shall not take the name of the Lord thy God. <laughs> Keep the Holy Sabbath. I shall honor thy father and mother. shall not kill it. And, and the whole house gets quiet. And people are like looking out from the, from the room. And they're like looking at the front door. One house, there was a guy like dressed up with, with a vampire, you know. And he, and he says, that's scary. <laughs> So they're like, here, kid, take all the candy you want. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and, um, but anyway, but, but it's this idea that uh, in, instead of um, when these pagans were doing holidays, uh, instead of uh, ignoring it and having a brand new Christian holiday, they said, let's show the superiority of Christianity by having our holiday smack dab on top of their holiday. Right, and then over time, people will forget the pagan stuff, and all they remember is the Christian stuff. And yeah. that was the attitude. It wasn't like, oh, let's weave a little bit of this pagan stuff in there. Yeah. And um, so, you know, um, it's a very great but, perspective because a lot of people uh, make a big deal out of that, and and really lose the opportunity to assert the gospel. Now, so now we've established the tree. And it is interesting, uh, I don't know if I put it in my presentation or not, but for centuries after this, the tree was a, depicted as a triangle, right? An evergreen tree. Mm -hmm. And it was a symbol of the Trinity, 
right? Oh, good. The three sides, Father, Son, the Holy Ghost. Nice. And nice. very similar to St. Patrick when he evangelized Ireland, he used the three-leaf clover to depict the Trinity, right? Wow. Hmm. Three little three-leaf clovers, you know, hmm. and one, three persons, one God. And so the Christmas tree as a triangle was per- portrayed as the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost. Now, the lights in the tree, the earliest depiction of lights at this time of year is Hanukkah. Okay. So bef- uh, before Christ, there was this period where, uh, you know, Cyrus of Persia let the Jews go back and rebuild their temple. And so the Jews have some little bit of freedom, but they're under the Persian Empire. But Alexander the Great conquers the Persian Empire. And uh, now you have this pagan Greek naked stuff, right? The statues coming in. Uh, and then Alexander the Great dies. His kingdom is divided into four. And the Seleucid general takes all the, the Persian Empire. And uh, he thinks the Jews are going to rebel. And so he goes in there and kills a whole lot and um, outlaws their Jewish religion, uh, put, you know, sacrifices a pig in the altar, uh, does all this stuff. And so the Jews finally drive these Seleucid, you know, Syrian pagan people out. And they're going to rededicate, clean out the temple. They're going to relight the lamp. There's not any oil. They find one little bitty flask of oil, and it's just enough to burn this lamp for one day. But they do it anyway, and it stays lit for eight days. And so this is uh, the celebration of call, called the Feast of Dedication, or Hanukkah. And even Jesus celebrated Hanukkah. It says in John um, that um, Jesus was in Jerusalem for the Feast of Dedication. And the people came up to him and said, how long will you wake us? Wait, you know, wait, are you the Christ? And, and um, so, so prior to Jesus, there were, there were lights, candles lit at this time of year. They were lit during Jesus' time. And they were lit. Uh, and so the thought is that sur- surely Martin Luther would have seen or been aware of Jews lighting candles at this time of year. And maybe that's where he also got the idea to put candles in the branches of the tree at the time of um, uh, when he put the, you know, the tree in his house as the sky above Bethlehem on the night of Christ's birth. Uh, is this interesting? It is, yeah. And then we have England. Um, and so you have Henry VIII bring the Reformation to England, not because he had a spiritual experience like Martin Luther. He just wanted another wife. And yes. the Pope won't recognize his divorce from Catherine of Aragon, and he decides to make himself his own Pope. And he went on to have six wives, divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. Um, Henry um, uh, more or less brings back an old Roman holiday. We have to remember that Britain was a Roman colony. Right. And the Romans had a feast at the end of the year called Saturnalia. And Saturn was their god of feasting and plenty and merriment, sort of a party guy. And so during Henry VIII's time in England, Christmas was a party time. It was sort of like Mardi Gras. Now, what's Mardi Gras? Mardi Gras was a holy day that was the beginning of the 40-day fast and prayer time before Easter. And it was the, you know, the last meal that you had before the beginning of Lent, before Easter. But, right. but Mardi Gras was a holy day, getting yeah. ready to dedicate yourself. Uh, but now Mardi Gras is a lewd party. Mm. And it's sort of what happened with Christmas under Henry VIII. It became drinking and carousing and partying. And um, uh, Saturn, uh, the god of, Roman god of feasting and plenty and merriment. Mm-hmm. If you remember the Christmas Carol with Charles Dickens, there is the spirit of Christmas present. And he's this guy with robes and a wreath in his hair and, and goblet of wine and fruit. And, and um, you're looking at him asking yourself the question, who is he? Mm. He sort of looks like Santa Claus, but he also sort of looks like some Greek God. Mm. Well, that was Saturn, but they Christianized him, called him Father Christmas. Okay. Couldn't call him St. Nicholas because uh, when the Reformation happened, they outlawed uh, St. Nicholas in in England. Um, But you can begin to see uh, it was in England where some of this mixing took place. Um, And then you had the Puritans. Now, the Puritans were persecuted. Finally, with Oliver Cromwell, they took over England, and the Puritans outlawed Christmas. The Puritans were really strict. Matter of fact, the Puritans tore down William Shakespeare's Globe Theater. Why? Oh, because no. they what said, party poopers? Yeah, they said that 
it's lewd, you're taking God's name in vain, and they, they forbade Shakespeare from writing plays, even mentioning the name of God. How could you mention God's name in your lewd play? It's, it's it, disrespectful. And so it was after this that Shakespeare began to write like Midsummer Night's Dream and these little nymphs. And, you know, he had to refer to some, you know, greater power to fit in with his play, but he couldn't mention God. And so now it's this, you know, sort of Greek fairy tales type, type stuff. Mm. Um, but the Puritans outlawed Christmas and the Puritans settled America. And um, here's one of the Puritan founders. He says, can you and your conscience think that our Holy Savior is honored by mad mirth, long eating, hard drinking, and lewd gaming, and rude revelry, and a mass fit for none other than a Saturn or a Bacchus or a night of Muhammad and Ramadan? Because the Muslims would fast during the day, but they would eat a whole lot at night, right? right. He says, you cannot possibly think so. So the Puritans, uh, they were really, really strict, and um, the Muslim sort of swung the other way. So the Puritans in New England, 1659, passed a law. Whosoever shall be found observing any such day as Christmas and the like, either by forbearing labor or feasting or any other way upon such account, a force that every such person sh shall pay for each offense five shillings as a fine to the county. Hmm. So you couldn't even celebrate Christmas under the Puritans. Um, so the pilgrims came over. They did not celebrate Christmas. Sort of interesting. A second boatload of pilgrims came over and they sort of wanted to celebrate Christmas. Here's the ship's log. The captain of the Mayflower was Christopher Jones. And this is the first time the pilgrims come over, December 25th, 1620. He says, at anchor in Plymouth Harbor, Christmas Day, but not observed by these colonists, they being opposed to all saints' days, etc. Mm -hmm. A large party went ashore this morning to fell timber to begin building. They began to erect their first house, about 20 feet square for their common use to receive them and their goods. So here, the pilgrims, they didn't want to do saints' days. And they said, you know, Every day is the same. The Sabbath is our is our holy day. And then William Bradford, he's the governor of the pilgrims. He writes in 1621. And one more incident rather amusing on Christmas Day, the governor called the people out to work as usual. But most of the new company, ones that came on a second ship, excused themselves and said it went against their consciences to work on that day. So the governor told them if it made it if they made it a matter of conscience, he would spare them till they were better informed. So he went with the west, the rest and left them. But on returning from work at noon, he found them at play in the streets, some pitching the bar, some at stool ball and such like sports. So he took them, he, he went to them and took them away their games and told them that it was against his conscience that they should work in others, uh, they should play in others' work. If they made the keeping of the day a matter of devotion, let them remain in their houses, but there should be no gaming and reveling in the streets. So you can see even back then, the uh, push to have it be, you know, not have anything to do with uh, the games and the parties and so forth, and then keeping it, you know, religious and spirit. Even the pilgrims had to debate uh, that type of question. Wow. And um, now the Dutch. The Dutch loved Christmas. The Dutch founded New Amsterdam, which became New York. The ship that they came over had on the prow of the ship a St. Nicholas statue hmm. instead of a mermaid or a Poseidon. It was a St. Nicholas. Why? He's the patron because saint St. of Nicholas sailors. Was, he was the patron saint of sailors. Got right? it. Well, much, much more sensible than a mermaid. And then they founded a church in, in New Amsterdam, which became New York. And the church was the St. Nicholas Dutch Reformed Church. And uh, now... This is interesting. So, you know, the Catholic saying that St. Peter's at the gates of heaven. Sure. Uh, and so, you know, uh, the Greeks did a take on um, the verse in the book of Revelation where Jesus will return at the end of the world to judge the living and the dead riding a white horse. And the saints will come back with him riding white horses. And St. Nicholas is a saint, so he will be one of those riding a white horse. But since he's such a special saint to the Greeks, they have him coming back once a year for a little mini judgment. Right? Hmm. A little checkup on the kids, make sure they're on the right track, see who's <laughs> naughty, see who's nice. That's just and, what we um, all need, mini judgments. <laughs> and so, so the, the, they say, yeah, you know, the, there's going to be the end time judgment, but St. Nicholas gets to come back to do this little mini judgment checkup. So in Holland, the Dutch still have St. Nicholas coming once a year as a Christian bishop 
riding a white horse and uh, he gives presents to the good kids. And um, it's sort of funny. They also add that the naughty kids, now in Norway, they didn't have horses, so they had St. Nicholas riding a reindeer. And uh, the elves turned into, I'm sorry, the angels turned into the elves. And the Lamb's Book of Life turns into the book of the naughty and the nice. And the, um, uh, the saints come from where? Heaven, the celestial city, the New Jerusalem, that turns into the North Pole. So you can see what started out as a, you know, Bible story with, you know, inferences is now becoming more of the, the secular version of it. And um, uh, but still, uh, so here you have, you know, a picture of there's St. Nicholas. He's giving out gifts, but there's little angels giving out the gifts. Oh, so uh, but cute. Then the, the angels turn into the elves, you know, and, um, and then the, the, the saints come from heaven. And now that turns into the North Pole. And, uh, and the Lamb's Book of Life and Book of Works turns into the Book of the Naughty and the Nice. And here's in Holland, they got the little kids looking at the book, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, there's the Bishop Nicholas. And, um, and this little kid doesn't look like he's too happy. You can imagine that there's St. Nicholas saying, <laughs> you weren't very good this year. And the little boy's about to cry. Now, yeah. if you look in the background, you see a guy with a black face. Yeah. Who's that? Well, they added to the story that St. Nicholas will come back with a Muslim helper named uh, Zvarte Peter, Black Peter. And the good kids get a present. But the naughty kids uh, get put in a, in a gunny sack and they get taken back to Spain and sold as, as, into slavery. In the so Muslim slave there, markets. St. Nicholas, <laughs> Nicholas getting presents to the good kids. And who's on the other side? There's Varte Pete. And the, uh, he's going after those kids. And they're all running away. They're, they're like freaked out. <laughs> so, you, so this um uh story you know there's the Zavarte Pete and um wow and I, I love this one and Here's, so this is all the the dutch was it the dutch yes how I racist actually, i actually did a uh uh radio interview one time and a guy from holland calls in he goes yeah we we did in our neighborhood all the little boys would go to sleep at night with a pocket knife in their pocket wow I go, why is that he goes that's in case we woke up and we were inside a Zuarte Pete's a gunny sack. We'd cut our way out. Wow. And I mean, the little kids took this serious, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I just I love this picture. I mean, here's St. Nicholas grabbing the little kid. They're shoving him in the bag. And look at the parents in the background. They're like, okay, bye. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, um, and there's another one, you know, and the little girl's like, oh, no. Santa Claus is coming. I, I have five brothers and five sisters. I'm from a big family. Wow. But I would have loved to have tormented my little brothers with this one. Hey, yeah. Santa Claus is coming. Might not see. It's been really good having you as a brother. Now, now go to sleep. <laughs> There's another one. They're, they're grabbing the little boys and look at those other little kids crying. And please don't take my little brother. Yeah. You know, the parents are like, sorry, we, we told you. you should have Santa Claus just got really dark and disturbing. I know, I know. This is like serious, you know. It was like, bye, little brother. We'll miss you. <laughs> wow. And, uh, <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and then some of the stories, he, he gets really bad there. Okay. And, um, so the Dutch settled New Amsterdam, which becomes New York. The Dutch loved the St. Nicholas traditions. Their first church in is called the St. Nicholas Dutch Reformed Church. Um, there's the, um, the ship, the Good Frau but it had a figurehead of St. Nicholas on the prow. Yeah, cool. Um, they had the uh, old stone Dutch Reformed Church founded in 1642, Battery, New, you know, New York. Is that still standing? Uh, it, no, but it did grow into the largest Protestant church in North America. Hmm. It was huge. It was finally, you know, they had this big thing there, um, and it was at the corner of Fifth Avenue in New York at 48th Street. But as the city became more financial, uh, People that residential people moved out of town and it more, was more or less empty. And there was just a few people left on the school board. And um, I mean, the, ch the church board and Sinclair oil company comes to them and says, we want to buy this corner property hmm. and they sell it to them and they tear the church down oh, to no. build the Sinclair oil company building. Look at this beautiful church. I mean, it was, it's just such a tragedy. They tore that thing down yeah. to build another you know, anyway, so it was, it was sold in 1949. Uh, but the church moved out to the, the county 
and they renamed it the Marble Collegiate Church, and that's where Norman Vincent Peale was the pastor. And who went there? Well, among other people, Donald Trump went there. But it was considered the the uh, most traditional church in New York. It was the oldest congregation. But this is the St. Nicholas Church over in Holland. And so St. Nicholas, again, is a big deal to the Dutch. He's still a saint, the Dutch. He's still a, a Christian man. And um, anyway, giving presents to the little kids. Um, and uh, but then New Amsterdam, which became New York, uh, there was a writer named Washington Irving. He's the one who wrote Rip Van Winkle, Legend of Sleepy Hollow. He wrote Dietrich Knickerbocker's History of New York from the beginning of the New World to the end of the Dutch dynasty. And it's like a, you know, John Bunyan. It's, it's like a bunch of fanciful stories like Rip Van Winkle, you know. Uh, but he tells who the story. Who is Dietrich Knickerbocker? Was that a fictional it's a made-up name? made-up name. Okay. It's a made-up name. Uh, but it was so popular, that's where you get the New York Knicks basketball team. The ah, Knicks. the Knicks are ah, the Knickerbockers. Yes. Who right. Wrote um, the history. Oh, got it. And so anyway, um, so Washington Irving wrote this, and he says in Knickerbocker's history, he says, St. Nicholas rode over the housetops, drawing forth magnificent presents, dropping them down the chimneys of his favorites. Now he visits us but once a year. Uh, when he rattles down the chimney, confining his presents merely to children's stockings found mysteriously filled. Washington Irving changes the description of Nicholas from wearing a bishop's outfit to wearing a Dutch outfit of long trunk hose, leather belt, stock and hat, right? And, um, uh, and a large pipe. Uh, and then he says, laying his finger beside his nose, gave a significant look, then mounting his wagon, he returned over the treetops and disappeared. And, uh, but the kids were still hanging to stockings by the fire because he is St. Nicholas and he did give presents to the poor. Um, and then in New York, 1923, uh, a Hebrew professor, Clement Moore, writes a poem for his children, a visit from St. Nicholas. Uh, he, his family actually donated land for an Anglican uh, seminary in New York, and there's a park. It's called the Clement Moore Park right there in New York City. Um, but in his poem, A Visit from St. Nicholas, he writes, um, uh, "'Twas a night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas would soon be there." Mm. When what to my wondering eyes would appear but a miniature sled and a tiny reindeer, a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. Hmm. With stretching fur from his head to his foot, his clothes all tarnished with ashes and soot, the little toys he flung on his back looked like a peddler opening his pack. His eyes how they twinkled, dimples all merry, his cheeks like roses, his nose like a cherry, a droll little mouth thrown up like a bow, and his beard of his chin was white as snow. So yep. the pipe heel tightened his teeth, the smoke had encircled his head like a wreath. Like, when did he take up smoking? That tobacco <laughs> came from the American Indians, you know? And, um, he had a broad face and a round little belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. A chubby, plump, right jolly old elf. I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. He filled all the stockings and turned with a jerk and laying his finger aside his nose gave a significant, and gave him a nod up the chimney he rose. And I heard him say, happy Christmas to all and all, good night. Anyway, uh, now he's shrunk in size, but he's still St. Nicholas. Uh, and then Civil War in America. There's an illustrator, Thomas Nast, Harper's Weekly Magazine. He's the one who invented the Republican elephant and the Democrat mule. Okay. And so he's the first one to put a North Pole sign. So he's, a, he's, a, this, he's a political cartoonist. Right. And it was a political jab at the South to say St. Nicholas is associated with the North. But here's St. Nicholas on a wagon, see little boys with the toys. And so it's like, you know, sort of a jab North and South during the Civil War. Okay. And um, anyway, uh, it's it, he... Um, then is portrayed, you know, uh, and then you got Coca-Cola. They got an artist named Haddon Sundblom. He became popular by designing the Quaker Oats Man and the Aunt Jemima Syrup. And he uh, was an artist for Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola invented mass marketing. It's the best known trademark name in the world, Coca-Cola. Right. And um, uh, he, for 30 years, he did a painting every year of St. Nicholas, Santa Claus, uh, drinking Coke. Now, Santa Claus is the Dutch pronunciation of Saint Nicholas. Saint Nicholas. Mm. Saint Nicholas. Santa Claus. So Santa Claus is just Dutch for Saint Nicholas. And um, anyway, now he's full grown again. Huggable grandfather. You know, rosy cheeks. A uh, nice complexion. You know, just uh, uh, a nice again huggable grandfather type guy. But that's the image that got spread all around the world because of Coca Cola. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, but, uh, I thought this was funny. <laughs> Got him smoking <laughs> cigarettes, you know, right? and, um, well, why not? He's migrated from a pipe to a, to a cigarette, but, uh, you know, anyway, um, 
But the point I bring out is that if you peel back the layers of the onion, so to speak, the Santa Claus today uh, was the St. Nicholas, uh, but it goes all the way back to the Greek guy who mm. was a real person, who was a real Christian, who was imprisoned under Roman emperor, uh, willing to face death for his faith in Jesus, mm. that he gave to the poor, but he wanted to do it anonymously because he wanted the credit to go to God. He stood up against corrupt politicians, he was pro-life, stood against uh, exposure of unwanted infants and so forth. And um, anyway, so we can choose to remember the real story uh, and of there really is a, a Santa Claus. So that's my book. The book is There Really Is a Santa Claus, The History of St. Nicholas and Christmas Holiday Traditions. And my website is AmericanMinute.com, AmericanMinute.com, uh, where you can order this. And um, I also have it as an ebook, so you can order it and have it emailed to you. And, the, you know, the pictures are all in color. So uh, hope you uh, found that interesting. Bill, thank you so much. I've, um, I've really enjoyed uh, reading the ebook. I, I got the ebook version of it. And um, it's uh, great plowing through it. It's a great little uh, a reference as, as well um, for some of these things. It's great to even have Santa Claus redeemed a little bit from being this uh, Coca-Cola commercial um, and, and central to the commercialization of Christmas altogether, redeemed back to, hey, this guy was a committed Jesus-worshipping believer. And, um, and, and this is the whole purpose of Christmas. He, he was all about those things that you mentioned, all the things that the kingdom of God is all about. And that is, you know, peace on earth between um, mankind and our creator, that finally the war is over between us and there's the opportunity of salvation for God to satisfy his wrath and demonstrate his mercy in the one life of Jesus Christ offered as a sacrifice that first uh, Christmas gift. Um, so that, that book is, is just really good. And I also love about your website. Uh, I love American history. Um, I'm fascinated with it as an Australian. It's uh, not irrelevant to our own history and the advent of Christianity throughout um, Western democracy. Um, certainly as, as integral a role as England played in our in our common um, Christian legal traditions and and constitutions etc. So thanks for all the work that you do and um, and yeah I encourage everybody to check out AmericanMinute.com and um, and look for other videos on the internet with um, with William Federer and uh, that's uh, exactly the place uh, to get some of that history. Now we're also going to have um, more interviews with you in the future and uh, there's just so much to do i'm, I'm certainly going to break this interview into um, into smaller pieces um so that people can di digest it in in chapters perhaps um but we'll also well, put the full the full thing up there as well well dave thank you so much it's been an honor being on with you and uh, uh merry christmas to all and to all a good night <laughs> and look forward to the next time very good. Thank you very much. That's uh, William Federer, and you can uh, get all of his details, find out much more, order the book. Um, there really is a Santa Claus for yourself, and it might make a great Christmas present for somebody, and also get a whole lot more information from AmericanMinute.com. Just a reminder that the Church and State Summit is on in February, and we've got uh, Dr. Michael Brown coming over all the way from America as well as uh, many other high caliber speakers uh, from Australia just to share more information about our Christian heritage, our Christian legacy, and what the Church of Jesus Christ has to offer, um, like Santa Claus, as activists for justice and righteousness and peace and good morals in a nation. This is a blessing to our 25 million neighbours. And uh, this is not something that we have any right to withhold from them. And so the Church and State Summit is all about equipping, empowering, encouraging and inspiring Christians to be like Bishop Nicholas of Myra, uh, somebody who's actively involved in, in the welfare of his nation and, and his neighbours. Uh, so you can get details for that, register for the Church and State Summit and get more information um, at churchandstate.com.au. This year, for the first time, the summit is going to four cities. 
the full two-day summit will be in Brisbane. But uh, before that, we're going to spend an afternoon and an evening in Auckland and Melbourne and Sydney. And uh, that's going to be a whole lot of fun. So if you can't make it to Brisbane, I hope you can make it to one of those other stops. And of course, um, if you can't make it at all, or if you're there and you want to relive the whole thing, you're also going to be able to get the whole lot on video. Um, but that's it for Pello Talk. Don't forget to head to my website, davepello.com. Subscribe to newsletters there. And you can also follow me on all the social media channels at Dave Pello. And uh, until the next time we uh, see you, I'll see you in the comments section.